Tripura Rahasya, one of the most fascinating tantric texts and this is really one of the few texts where we really see the power of Shakti coming through. In this amazing text we have wonderful, very interesting stories, very unusual stories, especially considering that these texts are very ancient and we find that there are very strong women in this text who are the teachers. The basic storyline is that the sage Parshurama makes many inquiries. He had a very troubled life and he killed many warriors. He was himself a Brahman, but he killed many warriors or Kshatriyas as they are called and eventually took to the path of spirituality. He comes finally to his teacher, the great sage, teacher of teachers, Dattatreya. Dattatreya initiates him and he goes to Mount Mahendra where he practices for 12 years. Even after 12 years, there are many questions that are unanswered. He is still suffering. He is still has a lot of um, misery, as he calls it. And he returns to his teacher, Dattatreya, to ask further questions. Chapter 2 starts now with the second meeting between Parshurama and Dattatreya, where Parshurama makes inquiries and his Gurudev, Dattatreya, answers the questions. And generally the way it works is that teachers always answer these questions in, in a story form. So you have a story within a story within a story. It's very common in many of the Indian epics, for example, Mahabharata Ramayana. And it keeps you on your toes. So we begin with chapter 2. On receiving instructions from his Gurudev, Parshurama bowed and inquired, O Lord, my spiritual master, nor of all, compassionate one, you know that many years ago I became enraged with the members of the royal family. Twenty-one times I destroyed the ego and killed all the Kshatriya kings of the world. It was done for a specific purpose, reason. I pleased my ancestors by doing this. My ancestors became happy. Receiving instructions from my ancestors, I became calm. During those days, Rama the incarnation of Vishnu was at Ayodhya. In my pride, I created a serious conflict with him. Lord Ram defeated me. He was kind-hearted and a great devotee of the Brahmins. Therefore, he spared my life. After the defeat, I became disgusted with the world and repented. On the way home, suddenly I met the great sage Samvarta, he was completely covered by ashes, exactly as embers are covered. It was difficult to recognize him. His company gave me immense relief and a sense of abiding peace, just as a mist refreshes a man overheated by the midday sun. During these texts, uh, readings, you may notice some amazing imagery. One of these, which I would just like to briefly comment on, is the description of the great sage Samvarta. He is covered by ashes, exactly as embers are covered, indicating that outside the sage looks dirty, dusty, very ordinary, but inside he is like an ember burning it's fire and has a tremendous energy and potential. And we see that 
throughout this text amazing imagery which really also works at a deep unconscious level and that is a hallmark of most tantric texts i will continue reading His company gave me immense relief and a sense of abiding peace, just as mist refreshes a man overheated by the midday sun. I asked how he maintained this state of tranquility. He imparted the essence of all scriptures and spiritual teachings. But just as a beggar has no capacity to receive the immense treasure of the goddess Lakshmi, similarly, I could not assimilate the knowledge he imparted to me. When I again requested him to instruct me, he sent me to you. A brief comment here. We find during the process of spiritual evolution that we keep growing. As we grow, we expand our capacity to receive knowledge. So, Initially, we may find that a student is very fixed ideas and is not very open to, to learning. The awareness is very limited. And it's only with expanding awareness that he becomes more open to learning and primarily becomes more open to unlearning. We need to see ourselves understand our negative traits, qualities, let go of these and expand our consciousness in the process. So it is very much like the example that is often used is of a, of a bowl or a, or a glass that's full. You cannot add anything more, you cannot pour water into it or it will flow out overflow so you need to empty it first so also a beggar has no capacity to to receive the the treasure of the goddess Lakshmi the goddess of wealth and prosperity and abundance because it's the personality or the mentality the attitude which is that of poverty so we need to expand our awareness to be able to receive this treasure Goddess Lakshmi is not merely a symbol of material wealth and prosperity, but also spiritual wealth and prosperity. Back to the text. In the end, I have come to your lotus feet. In your presence, I feel happiness, just as an ignorant person feels joy in the company of the wise. Although, sorry, though I did not grasp what the seer Sambath told me, I listened as you described the glory of Tripura. This enabled me to develop faith and devotion in her worship. You are a symbol of the goddess Tripura. That symbol is always in my heart. In this state of mind, what fruits will I not receive? But even so, please explain what the Sage Sambharata told me so many years ago because without that knowledge, I cannot be satisfied. Without understanding his teachings, everything I do seems to be like the play of a child. Long ago, I worshipped the god Indra and other devas and in those ceremonies gave them costly gifts and grains. I heard from Sambhata that the fruits of these pious actions are of little value. If they are insignificant, will I be sorrowful? Not only is the absence of happiness painful, but pain mingled with joy is also painful. The path of rituals does not help one face his great fear. An even greater fear is the fear of death, and there is no escape. Even though I am engaged in the practice of Tripura, I feel this fear because the way I worship Tripura, the Mara God, Goddess, 
is not satisfying. It is like the play of my mind. Therefore, I regard it as child's play. The way you instructed me to worship the goddess is contradictory to other scriptures. The way rituals are performed differ from each other. Very shortly to comment on this. He is referring to what Sambhata told him before. At that time, his mind was not ready for that knowledge. So he didn't understand what Sambhata told him. But he recollects that there was something and he knew it was very precious knowledge. He comes back now to his teacher Dattatreya and asks him to explain what was that knowledge? What did I miss? From the text here, you can follow that he is worshipping the goddess Tripura. But it's clear that his method is different from what Sambhartha and Dattatreya have taught him. So he refers to the god Indra, other gods, talks about ceremonies with offerings of gifts and grains. But he had heard that these actions of giving offerings is of little value. And he, he says, the path of rituals does not help me face my fears. So though he's engaged in the worshipping worshipping uh, Tripura, the mother goddess, it doesn't satisfy him. So after practicing the worship of Tripura for 12 years on Mount Mahendra, he's, he was assailed with doubts. He began to question this method and ask, is this the right method really? This is external. And somehow it is not satisfying. It's like a play of the mind. But is this the real thing? So we can understand from this that there are different levels of Sri Vidya, of Shakti Sadhana, where initially a teacher may give some ritual practices if the student is not still developed enough or not evolved enough to receive the more internal practices. In the very first lecture or discussion we had, we talked about the different schools where we talked about Kala, Mishra and Samaya. And Kala in the first school is external practice. And so he refers to the fact that the way he was instructed by the Tatraya is contradictory to other scriptures. And the way rituals are performed also differs. So obviously, he is struggling with the idea of rituals and, and these practices or methods that Sambhartha and Dattatreya have taught him. Shibua's 12 years Parshurama worship Tripura in external we can only surmise from what he is saying here that there may have been a ritual element as well. But also the Tatraya and Samvarta gave him some hints. So it may have been even a mixed Mishra practice. It's not clear. So Parshurama continues. Apart from that, rituals differ according to the deity through which one worships. There are various ways of worship. Therefore, when a ritual is performed incorrectly, it does not give fruits exactly the way fruits are obtained from the fire ceremony. The entire ritual is false. Then how can it lead to truth? Moreover, these rituals are never ending. For those of you who do not come from an Indian background, just to mention this, that rituals here referred to could be rituals from any religion or tradition. There are rituals even in the Christian tradition and in many other religions, Buddhist as well, they all have these rituals, they all have practices that are external. And there are religions or communities that focus more on internal practices. 
but it's the nature of the mind. The mind needs sometimes external objects when the mind is not evolved enough to go completely within. And so even in some of the finest religions which are not encouraging idol worship, they do have pilgrimages or places of special energy where devotees can go and worship together. So it seems in, to be quite a, a human need for most people to collect together and to be an external place and uh, practice something together. But he's beginning to question these rituals. He's beginning to, to long for something deeper because he says these these have not satisfied him. Parashurama continues, But I observed that the revered sage Samvarta was fully tranquil, completely free from the desire for self-gratification. He seemed to be completely free and in a state of bliss. He followed the path of fearlessness. He looked like an elephant, sitting quietly in a forest pool in the midst of a conflagration. How did he attain that state which he talked about to me? Please, Gurudeva, tell me the secret. I am burdened by worldly obligations and responsibility. Please rescue me. Saying thus, Parshurama placed his head at his master's feet to express his gratitude and respect. The sage Dattatraya recognized his student's inspired state and realized that he was at last prepared to undertake the path of enlightenment. That is now the inner path. Any questions, any thoughts, any comments so far? Good. So, Parshurama has spoken very honestly and truthfully about his doubts and about his questions because for most people, this religions, modern religions or life, they have always been rituals. And rituals are useful, they are comforting, they have a value in that they give us a certain routine or certain amount of steadiness. And most rituals are in fact symbolic, so they work at a deeper subconscious level. But at a certain point of time, the mind begins to long to go inwards, gets tired of these external practices, gets tired of these rituals. And this happens spontaneously then. Shibu asks, 12 years of external practice are needed to purify the mind. Don't get too focused on the number 12 or 12 years of external practices. It's just an indicator that some people need time to evolve. It really depends on the person's karmic, you know, baggage, what you have done in your past lives. The, the impressions or the samskaras from previous life really determine at what state you start in this lifetime. There have been cases of sages, like, for example, Raman Maharishi at a very young age, he already took the internal path. He didn't have to go through external practices. Similarly, there are many stories. Uh, 
and I'm talking about historical figures and not just legends and uh, mythology. For example, the great sage uh, Samgyanishwar in, in Maharashtra uh, was a, a boy of nine when he was, you know, really having very deep experiences and attained the stage of Samadhi already by 16 and um, um, Kaivalya at 21. So don't focus too much on these numbers. Every person is different. Every person is unique. Puri, I think the same response to your comment. While that is true that the mo most of us need to go through a certain process to begin questioning life and uh, that process may be uh, painful, it may be a struggle, but that's not for everybody. There are those who have gone through this process in previous life, therefore these impressions are carried forward and they may see things just differently already from a very young age. So coming back to the text, the great sage Tathatraya responds. The compassionate sage Tathatraya responded, My son, your mind is fully purified. Attaining such a high state is like a drowning man who encounters a boat. By performing sadhana and having devotion, great people attain a highly auspicious state. Mother Divine, though formless, assumes a form and can manifest herself for the sake of her devotee and by enlightening him can give freedom from the bondage of death. As long as one is not free from the evil of his karma, he is not happy. He remains disturbed as if on the verge of death. How can one whose every limb is burning with poison be happy? The whole world is over, overwhelmed by the sense of duty and remains senseless and blind. Therefore, people of the world are not aware of what is good for them. Without knowing the ultimate goal of life, human beings blindly perform their actions and thus keep walking in the darkness of ignorance. Actions performed blindly simply perpetuate the cycle of birth and death. To comment on this, actions performed blindly or overwhelmed by a sense of duty, this is, there's nothing negative about performing duties, it's how you perform them, not blindly and senselessly, unconsciously. That is what keeps one bound in this cycle of birth and death and rebirth. When you perform all duties consciously, it will free you. But if you perform your actions blindly, unconsciously, they will keep you in a state of bondage. Now we come to one of the first short stories, a more a metaphor and an interesting one. Once upon a time, some hungry travelers were searching for food on Mount Vindhya. Believing they had found some cashews, they ate poison fruit instead, which made them extremely thirsty. Suffering from the effects of these poisonous fruits, those ignorant travellers then searched for something to quench their thirst. Mistaking some intoxicated fruits for grapefruit, ate them too. Disoriented by the effects of these intoxicating fruits, they lost their way. Some fell into ditches and were injured. Thorns pricked them, they blamed each other for their mishaps and started fighting. Covered with wounds, they finally arrived at a city. 
It was midnight by the time they reached the town gate. The gatekeepers would not allow them to enter. Oblivious to time and place, they fought with the guards and were again badly beaten. Running here and there, some fell into a deep moat and were trapped and eaten by crocodiles. Several fell into pits or wells and died. Only a few escaped. Similarly, people of the world run after tantalizing objects, inviting misery. But in their delusion, they persist in their race towards destruction. So this analogy or metaphor is given of most people being going through the world in a state of delusion and like one is intoxicated and hallucinating. You just see things, imagine things and you run after tantalizing, attractive things. And in doing so, you just invite misery and keep falling into situations which cause you more pain, more suffering, and you just do not get out of that. So very few people escape from that. Parshurama, you are very fortunate. That is why these earnest inquiries have arisen in your heart. Vichara and tranquility are the first rung on the ladder of the highest attainment. To attain tranquility is essential. How can one gain the auspicious height without it? So it is clear that Tatraya considers Parshurama to be one of those few who have escaped who have started questioning, asking earnest, making earnest inquiries. And vichara means inquiry. Vichara means contemplation. Vichara is the beginning, which then leads eventually to the highest attainment. So vichara and tranquility is calm mind, steady mind. How can one attain tranquility? How can one attain spiritual heights without this tranquility? And that Tatraya now talks about negative thoughts. So we need to understand what negative thoughts are and what positive thoughts are. So that Tatraya continues. The teachings, negative thoughts are like death. Only by understanding the auspicious goals will people stop running after trivial objects and finally become victorious. The demons who roam in the night go to destruction because of their negativity, while the devas, because of their positive attitudes, become deserving of happiness. Those having calm minds surrender themselves to Lord Vishnu and remain victorious over their enemies. Positive thought causes joy in the same way that a seed sprouts into a leafy tree. With positive thoughts, a man goes ahead of others and because of his positive power, Brahma is considered to be higher. Because of his positive power, Vishnu is worshipped everywhere. Through his positive brilliance, Lord Shiva is all in all. Though Ram, prince among men, was deceived by Marika and suffered heavily, later, by using the strength of his positivity, he created a bridge across the ocean and conquered Lanka, the city of demons. This has been explained to you. Negative thought feeds the ego. That is why Brahma had to lose one of his heads. Similarly, Lord Mahesha, in his spontaneous spontaneity, gave a boon to Pasmasura and disturbed, ran from place to another. By not using his positive power, Vishnu killed the wife of the sage Brigu. Brigu cursed him and he had to suffer. 
Similarly, many demons, devas and human beings under the influence of negativity had to face problems. To comment briefly about this, it may appear that the reference to all these gods and goddesses, that maybe this is something ritualistic. There is nothing ritualistic about it. They're referring to these mythological stories because they are commonly known. These mythological stories were, in fact, ancient teaching methods or manuals. That is how the teachings were handed down orally in the form of stories. They were all symbols. So we refer to the stories here such as the positivity in these deities. These are qualities and therefore the worship is the allowing the mind to dwell on these positive qualities. So Vishnu, the preserver, has the positive qualities of taking care of the world and those around us. Shiva, his positive brilliance, is about meditation, going deeper inside and getting to know yourself. The story of Rama, using his positivity to create a bridge and conquer the demons. The demons here are the negative thoughts and the gods are the positive thoughts and emotions that we have. So these are all symbols of the nature of the mind. So these are the positive and negative qualities that we ourselves possess. So the great sage Tattatraya continues, O Parsharama, blessed are those who maintain tranquility of mind in all situations. Those revered ones should be adored. For lack of positive thought, people perform their duties, remain caught in the snare of delusion. Thus they become victims of innumerable miseries. For ages, human beings have been caught in the web of negative thinking. As long as they are under the influence of that negative power, how can they think positively? How can one find cool water in a burning desert? Without spiritual means, how can one think harmoniously when his mind is negative and scattered? There is only one spiritual sadhana to overcome this problem. For building that positive attitude, there's only one way, and that is higher than any other means. Discrimination turns to the grace of Tripura, without the grace of the one who dwells in the inner chamber of the heart, of the lotus therein. How can one attain the blissful state? The light of consciousness will dispel the darkness of ignorance, and the means to attain it is devotion with firm faith. The great Mother Divine is the subject of worship when, by her grace, she is seen as the self-illuminated one in the depth of the heart. Supreme Goddess is identical with one's own self, the knower of all, the most resplendent, pure consciousness and the embodiment of auspiciousness. After being initiated by a realized teacher, one should follow the path sincerely and systematically. On the path of spirituality, devotion and faith are essential. O Parshurama, I have already taught you the rare scripture on the grace of Tripura, which is the root of this knowledge. By hearing her exalted, you attained her grace, the root of all goodness. Therefore, you will have no fears at all in the world. As long as positive thinking does not arise, a person remains fearful in daily life. Even after the cause of fear is removed, some degree of fear still remains, remains, persists. Just as a person recovering from a serious hallucinatory disease still suffers from weakness. So Parshurama has now expounded 
the nature of negative thoughts. He's, he talked about the lack of positive thought and how can one attain anything or achieve anything as long as one is caught in this web of negativity. And for that, there is only one spiritual sadhana and that is devotion with firm faith. The great mother is the subject of worship. But who is the great mother? It's not an external statue or idol. It is the self in the depth of the heart. The self-illuminated one in the depth of the heart. Pure consciousness. So follow the path sincerely and systematically as taught by a teacher who is part of a tradition, a lineage. And as we know, Tripura, the three cities are waking, dreaming and deep sleep. And when you maintain that awareness, you are one with the Great Mother. And so this is how this positive thinking must arise and you become fearless. Even when all fear, the cause of fear has been removed, the, the root may remain, just as one who has suffered from a disease may suffer still for a while from weakness. It takes time to recover fully. Any questions or thoughts so far? Great sage Dattatraya continues. However, the purpose of life is accomplished when one develops the capacity to discriminate and is always aware of his spiritual goal. If, after achieving human birth, one fails to cultivate positive thinking, the tree of human life does not bear fruit, just as a barren woman does not give birth to a child. Success is attained by positivity. This um, beautiful imagery comes again and again in this text. A barren woman cannot give birth to a child. So also positive thinking must somehow be cultivated. Otherwise the tree of life will not bear fruit. If you have the privilege of having a human body, but you have not cultivated this positive thinking, positive thinking in, includes good thoughts like honesty, compassion, friendliness, goodwill, simplicity, disciplined lifestyle, all these positive, positive thoughts and positive thinking. But if these are not there, then the tree of human life cannot bear fruit, just as a barren woman cannot give birth to a child. So this one comes repeatedly in this text. So for success in life, here it does not necessarily mean worldly success, but happiness. For this success, positivity, positive thoughts are required. Those who are devoid of positive thought are narrow in their thinking, like frogs in a well. A frog born in a well lives without knowing the difference between day and night. Similarly, a human being without positive attitude takes birth uselessly. He is not aware of what is beneficial or harmful for him, he goes through the round of births and deaths again and again without trying to discover what is beneficial. Under the influence of ignorance, he mistakes pain for pleasure and pleasure for pain. Thus he continually burnt, is burnt by the flames of 
worldly desires. People suffer, but never seek an end to suffering. A female donkey kicks the male again and again, yet he follows her. Similarly, people lead their lives in the world. Thus, O Parsharama, people do not renounce the world. You are endowed with pure intellect and you have crossed the ocean of delusion. So this last bit of chapter 2 talks about people who are living their life unconsciously like frogs in a well. They're living there in the darkness of the well and do not know the difference between day and night. So if you're a human like that who has no awareness, you go through life stumbling about like those in the story about the drunken people, leading an unconscious life, suffering a lot of pain, and not even being aware that you're suffering because you mistake pleasure for pain. And you think that pain is pleasure. Your, your, your buddhi is so clouded the mind is so clouded that you're not able to see the distant difference between these two. For to distinguish between this, you need to have a sharper buddhi. And that is not still there. So those who are ignorant, they go through the suffering. It seems, seems to be endless, but they, they still are so unconscious that they do not seek an end to the suffering. When we are referring here to renouncing the world, it's not tiaga. They do not have to renounce the world in the sense of giving up the world, but of developing the attitude of non-attachment. So, vairagya is meant here. Any questions or thoughts about this chapter? Any comments? Ross says, Seems the gem was that he discriminated his suffering and was led to vichara. Perhaps that was what was meant by his mind being purified, this and following the path sincerely and systematically. Yes, I, I think that's quite accurate. He was able to distinguish and understood that he was suffering and my purified mind was not referring to an enlightened mind, but one who had begun to see clearly and distinguish uh, between pleasure and pain, knowing that this is suffering and I want to get out of this suffering. You, you must want to get out of it. If you don't want to get out of it and you think that this is all cool, <laughs> then you, you pretty much stay in there. And funny enough, it, it, the circle always completes itself because eventually you acquire the attitude of a witness and then you see the world in a different perspective and it's no longer suffering. It's still the same world, but you are no longer attached to it. And then indeed it is it's a cool place. The world is a beautiful place and you see everything as consciousness, as a play. So we come to chapter 3, which is now the beginning of one of the very interesting stories, one of the main stories, where the princess Himalekha teaches her husband, the prince Himachuda. So this is the beginning of one of the more important stories in this text. And the 
woman teacher, female teacher, Hemaleka, the princess. It's a very, very interesting uh, situation, very interesting story. So we'll begin the story. The meeting of Hema Chuda and Hema Leka. This is the chapter on how they meet. I'm not sure if we can complete it, but maybe we can try. It's not, it's not that long. Having been taught by Sri Dattatreya, Parshurama wonders and humbly puts the question, O oh Lord, revered Gurudev, what you have said is true. People invite their own destruction by their negative attitudes. They can attain what is auspicious through positivity, which will lead them to listen to the glory of the goddess. I have heard it, but I have a serious doubt. How does one gain the opportunity to hear about Tripura? If this happens naturally in the course of events, then why has, then why has everyone not heard of her glory? Why was I not interested in learning about her before this moment? There are many people who are more miserable than I am, who should be more motivated to turn to Tripura. Why do they not have the opportunity to know about this subject? Please help me understand this. I think this is a good um, insight here that... Most people who are unconsciously living in the world do not even consider for a moment that there is a way out and have not heard of Tripura here means, of course, the concept of these three states of consciousness. I know many yoga teachers, for example, who have been teaching for decades but do not know about the three states of consciousness. They do not know about waking, dreaming, and deep sleep state. They have not heard, for example, about the Manukya Upanishad, which is really talking about these three states. They have not heard of these texts, because what they are taught in teacher's training programs are um, mostly physical practices, and intellectual study, perhaps, of the Yoga Sutras, which is so complicated, they don't understand anything, but they go through a kind of mechanical way of reading or studying it. And so this knowledge really is not well known. Nobody has heard of it. Almost nobody has heard of it. It's a, it's a, a rare thing. To this, Parshurama, uh, Dattatreya says, Listen, Parshurama, Satsang, the company of the wise, is the way to attain the absolute good. It dispels the darkness of ignorance. The company of the wise yields the most desirable fruit. You yourself attain this higher state that leads to the greatest good through the company of the leading sage, Sambhartha. Sages, find joy in the company of other great sages. Without the company of a sage, who could ever attain the highest bliss? Even in worldly life, a person sees the effects of the company he keeps. Now listen, Parshurama, I will tell you a story. So, Tattatreya responds to him by saying, it depends on the company you keep. If you keep the company of thieves, Sooner or later, the police are going to come knocking at your door and assume that you were involved in some theft, even if you weren't, simply because you kept the company of thieves. That's karma by association. So those people who have not heard of Tripura haven't heard of it because they are keeping the company of other worldly people. If you keep the company of those who are devoted to deeper spiritual seeking, then you will 
find such great treasures. And now he begins the story of Hemalekha and Hemachuda. Once upon a time there was a king of the Sarna named Muktachuda. He had two sons, Hemachuda and Manichuda. They were both handsome, intelligent and skilled in many sciences. One day, equipped with bows and escorted by the army, they went hunting in the forest of Mount Seya. Soon, their sharp arrows had brought down many deer, tigers, boars, buffaloes and wolves. As they were hunting, a tornado raged through the area, showering everything with debris and rocks. The sky was full of dust and the day appeared as dark as night. It became so dark they could not see the hills, trees or even each other. The whole mountain was engulfed in darkness. The troops, wounded by the hailstorm, scattered. They found shelter under trees and boulders or in caves, while the two princes fled on their horses. Eventually, Hemachuda, the elder prince, arrived at a beautiful hermitage, surrounded by banana and date trees. There he saw a lovely girl, as radiant as a flame, glowing like molten gold. Seeing that beautiful maiden, as enchanting as a goddess of good fortune, the prince smilingly inquired, O oh, lotus-eyed girl, who are you, dwelling in this forest fearlessly? Why are you living in this wild and lonely place? Whose daughter are you? With whom do you live? And why are you all alone at this moment? The beautiful girl replied, Welcome, prince. Please take your seat. It is the duty of an ascetic to welcome guests. You look tired and worn out. Tie the horse to the tree of dates. Rest and be comfortable and hear my story. For those of you who are finding the story a little bit complicated, to give you just a brief outline, the details don't matter. All that matters is that the prince, due to the circumstances, ends up meeting this beautiful girl who is Hema Chuda and to be his future wife. So the prince complied with her request. She served him fruit and juices and after he had relaxed a while, the girl spoke to him with honeyed words. O oh, prince, there is a sage named Vyagrapada who is a staunch devotee of Lord Shiva. Through the power of his austerities, he has conquered spheres of reality, won only by those with the highest virtues. He is an knower of absolute reality and was endowed with the knowledge of Brahma, Brahman. Many great sages used to attend him. My name is Himalekha. I am his adopted daughter. Once upon a time, a charming and beautiful celestial girl named Vidyagrihi went to bathe in the Vena River. By chance, during that time, the king of Vanga was present there. He saw that beautiful girl bathing in the river. Because of her wet clothes, her breasts were visible. Charmed by her beauty, the king gently approached her and she agreed to his proposal. After making love with her, the king returned to his capital without being aware that the girl had become pregnant. Fearing criticism, that beautiful girl abandoned the infant. The sage Vyagrapada happened to be passing by on his way to his evening meditation. He took me to his hermitage and raised me with love and care. A father is one who fulfills his duty by taking care of his children. I am his daughter and serve him. Because of his spiritual greatness, there is no reason for me to have any fear. Neither gods nor demons with their evil thoughts can enter this ashram. For if they were to approach, they would be destroyed. This is my story. O Prince, please stay and rest for a while. So that in brief was the background of both the prince and princess and 
you may have noticed that the text is quite um, unusual. It's a tantric text. It's not a Vedic text. It's not conservative. It is very um, unusual for the time. And uh, it's not uh, afraid of uh, sexuality and uh, the, the, the imagery is also quite um, unusual for its time. My father, Yagrabada, is about to come. Wait and pay homage to him, and he will fulfill your desire. Then, early tomorrow morning, you may proceed. After listening to her, the prince, overwhelmed by her beauty, wanted to speak to her, but he became nervous. The astute young woman understood what the prince, that the prince had fallen in love with her, and said, O oh, prince, have courage and wait. My father will be coming very soon. Wait until he arrives, and then request that he give you my hand. As she spoke these words, the great sage entered with the flowers and fruit he had collected for worship. On his arrival, the prince got up with reverence. Introducing himself, he bowed his head reverently, sat down again, only with the sage's permission. The sage noticed that the prince was bewildered because of the lust in his mind for he used his yogic power and assessed the situation. He gave the prince Himalekha's hand. Overjoyed, the prince took her to his capital. With pleasure, his father married them according to the Vedic rites. The prince began enjoying his married life, sometimes in the forest, sometimes on the banks of the river, and sometimes in other places. But to his dismay, the prince noticed that his bride was not interested in sensual gratification. She always seemed indifferent. Finally, one day he gently said, Darling, I love you, but you do not seem to respond to my love. Your smile is very charming, but why do you not find delight in lovemaking? Does it not please your heart? Why are you sad? You seem to be indifferent. How can I enjoy you when you are so detached? I am fully devoted to you, but it seems that your mind is always elsewhere. When I speak to you, I feel you have not heard. I have been sitting here for a long time embracing you, but you have not noticed. And you ask, Lord, when did you come? As though you were unaware of my presence. You have the best of enjoyable objects in front of you. Even so, you do not think of them. Why do you not express yourself? When I am not with you, you start meditating. I notice these things whenever I see you. If you have no appreciation for worldly pleasures, then tell me, how can I enjoy myself, where I feel like a man embracing a wooden statue? I will fulfill your wishes. As the lily opens its petals in moonlight, similarly, my heart is open to you. You're dearer than my life. Why are you indifferent? Swear upon God so that my doubt is dispelled. So we see from this dialogue that the prince was very much in love with her, but the princess was very indifferent to these sensual pleasures. It is actually... The next chapter, the chapter 4, that the wonderful dialogue takes place between the two where the princess Himalekha explains very beautifully um, the highest teachings. And again she uses interesting stories to explain these. So you see the stories within stories within stories. It's a text that can be mind-boggling and full of imageries as well. And um, it, it works at an unconscious mind level. So it can be very fascinating and very um, enlightening. <laughs> so I hope everybody enjoyed that. We will continue next Saturday. 
if there are any questions, if there's anything anybody would like to say, Perry said, just like eating a sweet mango, I'm glad you find it nice. Yes, I got some mangoes today, so I think I should go and have a sweet mango. Thanks, Perry, for reminding me. Joanne, lovely weekend also to you. Bye-bye, Mita, Shibu, thank you for being there. Jayan, good to see you. Bye-bye, Ross. Bye, Mita. Uh, bye, Manisha, Pudi, Rajesh, Matthias. See you all.